have you take your Bibles now and turn to the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel. We're ready to go. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this chapter is a, is a fascinating chapter. And I hope you don't think that that's just a word that I uh, like to hear when I say that something is intriguing or something is fascinating, something is interesting. I'm not simply picking out words that I like to hear. I'm saying these because I have picked them purposely to convey what I fully believe in my heart. Now, one of the outstanding chapters here, as far as historical data is concerned and the lessons that we can draw from it, is right here in the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel. I cannot remember, ladies and gentlemen, when I first began to study these great books. But I do know that I've spent about as much time on this fourth chapter in my research, historical research, as anything else in the book of Daniel. Now, someone said, well, Brother Rudd, what is it? Well, the analysis of chapter 4 of the book, book of Daniel, and that chapter simply covers 37 verses. It's Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. You remember the first dream he had was in the second chapter of that great composite man or that metallic image or that colossal statue. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here is the second dream that he had, and it has to do with a giant tree. In other words, he sees a dream of a tree. And then, of course, the entire chapter is nothing more than the edict of the king. I'm talking about Nebuchadnezzar that he published after his recovery from the sickness that God brought on him. Now, everything that we read about here in the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel has already transpired. As a matter of fact, ladies and gentlemen, if I may, for the benefit of those of you who are interested, put down these dates, I think it will help. If you look at the first verse of Daniel 4 and write in your margin the year 470 B.C., in other words, this is when this happened. Now, if you look down in verse 28, at the end of the 12 months, he was walking the royal palace of Babylon. Now, you'll find that he became sick. He lost his reasoning power. Now, look in verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. Now, that's seven years later. That brings us down to the year 563. So, the fourth chapter here that we're talking about covers a period of some seven years. And as I've already said, it's nothing more than the account of Daniel of the edict that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, gave after the recovery of the insanity that came upon him. I want you to understand that. And some of the very finest lessons that we can have today as Christian people are found right here in this great fourth chapter. All right, pull up your pencils or pull up your chair, get your pencils and your paper, and let me give you a, a simple analysis of this fourth chapter, Roman numeral number one, the reason why that this edict was promulgated. I said that this was the edict of the king published after his recovery. Now, this covers the first three verses, verses one to three. Let me repeat it again, Roman numeral number one, the reason why this edict was promulgated, verses one to three. All right, Roman numeral number two, a statement of the fact that he had a dream which upset him. Verses 4 to 7, a simple statement of the fact that he had a dream which upset him. All right, now this is all in the edict or in the letter that Nebuchadnezzar wrote. All right, number 3, Roman number number 3, the statement of the actual dream as related to Daniel. In other words, he told this dream to Daniel, and we've got a statement of the actual dream as related to him in verses 8 through verse 18. Now mark that if you will, please. All right, Roman numeral number four. And here we have Daniel's interpretation of the dream, verses 19 to 26. Roman numeral number four, Daniel's interpretation of the dream. Now, I want to subdivide this, ladies and gentlemen, because this is the most important part of the chapter. If you would misunderstand this, of course, you'll not get anything out of this edict or this proclamation put out by Nebuchadnezzar relative to what happened to him. All right, let me repeat it again. Roman numeral number four is Daniel's interpretation of the dream. This covers verses 19 to 26. Now, under, under that, write an A. We're subdivided. All right, now this is what Daniel said. Number one, number A, that he would become a maniac, a lunatic. He would become insane. This is the interpretation of his dream. Number B, that he would be driven from his throne and his kingdom. Talking about Nebuchadnezzar. That's number B under four. 
that he would be driven from his throne and his kingdom. All right, number C, under number four, that he would be compelled to abide with the beast of the fields. Now, this is what Daniel told this great king. Now, ladies and gentlemen, again, allow me to say that these are powerful words coming from a little lowly prophet or preacher to a great monarch like Nebuchadnezzar. I'll talk about this a little bit later on. All right, Roman numeral number five. The advice of Daniel for him to repent of his sins and to become a righteous man. Verse 27. And also are the results if he failed. Now let me repeat that again. Roman numeral number five. The advice of Daniel for him to repent of his sins and become a righteous man are the results if he refused to do it. Verse 27. All right. Roman numeral number six. The fulfillment of the prediction of Daniel that is, verses 28 to 33. In other words, he refused to repent. He did not become a righteous man. And therefore, we have the results here depicted in verses 28 to 33. The fulfillment of the predictions of Daniel. All right, Roman numeral number seven. At the end of the appointed time, his health and reason would be restored. All right, verse, uh, Roman numeral seven. At the end of the appointed time, his health and reason would be restored, and this is re revealed in verses 34 to 36. All right, and finally the last point, Roman numeral number 8. After his resurrection to his former position, his praise to God and his advice to others who might be caught up in pride, as was he. Now this covers the last verse, verse 37. Now that's the last point. In my analysis of this chapter, nothing profound about it, simple for our elucidation. Now let's do this last one again. Roman numeral number eight. That after his resurrection, or his restora restoration, let's say, to his former position, his praise to God and his advice to others who might be caught up in pride, as was he. That's verse 37. All right, I've got my Bible here before me. I hope you have yours. Now, all of you turn with me there to the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel. As I said before, I want you to put a slanting mark at the beginning of verse 1, and then a slanting mark at the end of verse 3, and out in your margin, write number 1. In other words, that's the first section. All right, now then, after that, go down to verse 4 and put a little slanting mark, and let that one run down to the end of verse 7. That'll be number 2, write 2 in your margin. All right, now put a slanting mark the beginning at verse 8 and let it run all the way down through verse 18, at the end of verse 18, and that will be the third division. All right, now then put another slanting mark at verse 19, and this time let it run down to the end of verse 26. That will be number 4, Roman numeral number 4. All right, beginning then at verse 27. Put your slant mark there at verse 27. And let it end, run to the end of that verse. That's one verse. That's number five. All right. Now we're ready. Put a slanting mark there at verse 28. And let it run all the way over to the end of verse 33. That will be, of course, number six. That's the sixth division. All right. Now then, in verse 34, put your slanting mark at the beginning of the verse. And let it run down here now into verse 36, the latter part of verse 36. That will be Roman numeral number 7. All right, now the beginning of verse 37 to the end, we have the 8th division. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll do the entire book this way, and this is the way to study God's Word. I don't have any doubt about it whatsoever that when we do this, and if we could cover the entire Bible this way, that we could understand it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, turn back with me. And let's read this wonderful chapter, this intriguing chapter, about the life, a period of life, a period in the life of this great king, Nebuchadnezzar. All right, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all the nations, peoples, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. Now, you see, this is a letter. This is a proclamation. In other words, this is an edict that he writes. In other words, he addresses all the peoples under his control. Peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good unto me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. 
His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. All right, that is the beginning. That's the salutation of this edict that he put forth. Now then, we'll get into the heart of it. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace, I saw in a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the vision of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them. Now, he didn't forget this dream like he did his first one. He remembered this one. Remember in the case of that composite man, he had forgotten the dream and became extremely furious with those Chaldeans and soothsayers because they could not tell him what his dream was. But now in this case, he remembered his dream, and he remembered it well. He said, I told the dream before them, and they did not make known unto me, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Well, he probably still remembered Daniel. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. I noticed the first part of that, Bel, B-E-L. That's the God of the Chaldeans. This is the, this is the God that he made this great brazen as statue to yesterday that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to. All right, and he brought in Daniel after a while, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. You can see now that he's still a heathen. All of those acts, that we've already found in the second chapter and the third chapter relative to praising God meant nothing. He still believed that Daniel's God was simply one of many gods. All right. And whom is the spirit of the holy God? And I told the dream before him, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret trouble for me, tell me the vision of my dream that I have seen in the interpretation thereof. All right. Thus were the visions of my head upon my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. Now what did I say? I said that when we wrote down the analysis of chapter 4, that we have Nebuchadnezzar's second dream, which was a giant tree. That's it. This is what he saw. Verse 11. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was food for all. The beast of the field had shadow under it, and the birds of the heaven dwelt in the branches thereof, and all flesh was fed from it. A magnificent tree, ladies and gentlemen, a big tree, no doubt about it. Verse 13, I saw in the vision of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher, and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree and cut off the branches, and shake off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the beast get away from under it, and the fowls from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of its roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with a beast in the grass of the earth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to stop right here, if you will, please, and mark this word, his and let his portion. Now that's a masculine pronoun. And if we were referring back to this tree, which is referring to, it should be a neuter, which would be it. Now, I'll get to this in just a minute, but mark that by way of emphasis that we'll get back to it in a minute. Let it be wet. See there, let it be wet with dew of heaven, and let his portion be with a beast in the grass of the earth, let his, in other words, we have transferred our thought from it to him. And let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the Holy One. Now what is all this about? To the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men, and giveth it, that is, the kingdoms, to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it, that is, the kingdoms, the lowest of men. This dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen, and thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods, our God, is in thee. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, there is the dream. What is it? Well, the, begin the dream starts in verse 10, and it continues down through verse 18. I want you to remember that, and we'll be referring to this as we exegete and elucidate and analyze this great chapter. All right, verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was stricken dumb for a while, and his thoughts troubling. Now, this is not unusual in the case of Daniel. We'll find this many, many times as we're getting into this prophetic part, of the part of prophecy of this great book. Now, I want you to notice that he said his thoughts trouble him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation trouble thee. Daniel or Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee. In other words, they're going to like what I tell you. It's for their benefit. And the interpretation thereof to thine adversaries. They're the ones that's going to have a field day over it. This was the greatest king, ladies and gentlemen, that ever lived. He ruled the world at his time. But he had enemies, just like everybody has enemies that does anything. Now listen to me. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, fruit thereof much, and in it was food for all, under which the beast of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the birds of the heaven had their habitation, it is thou, O king. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there can be no doubt now, as I said, when we have a divine interpretation of a vision or a dream or a prophetic language or a prophecy of the truth of the interpretation. Now, I'm going to say, as did Daniel, that this tree that Nebuchadnezzar saw represented himself. There it is. Look at it. It is thou, O king, thou art grown and become strong, and thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion, dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven, and saying, Hew down the tree and destroy it, nevertheless leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast of the field, till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and it is the decree of the Most High. In other words, God of heaven is the one that's bringing this to pass, which is come upon my Lord the king, that thou shouldest be driven. Now, Daniel is not only talking about it, but he's giving an interpretation of it. Look at it. That thou shalt be driven from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and thou shalt be made to eat grass as oxen, and shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know, now listen to me, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Now ladies and gentlemen, this was written 563 years before Christ. Now if you'll take 1988 and add 563, I want you to notice that we're talking about 2,600 years. And did you realize that over a period of 2,600 years, there's very few of us upon this earth that have yet learned the lesson that God intended Nebuchadnezzar to learn, and that is that God rules in the affairs of men and gives these kingdoms to whom he wants to have them. We don't believe that. We have not yet learned that yet. All right, now watch me. He said, what did you say? That all of these have come upon you till T-I-L-L, -L, a certain time. In other words, you're going to be a raving maniac, a lunatic, till you learn something. Seven years, you're going to be driven from your palace. You're going to get out on all fours like a beast. You're going to actually eat grass like the beast of the field. Your fingernails are going to grow like claws. The hair of your head like the mane and the tail of a horse. And there is where you will stay for seven solid years. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have time. It would be interesting. It would be fascinating for me to relate to you all that we know about Nebuchadnezzar, this great king. Now, we have the history of Alexander the Great, Cyrus and Darius, Nebuchadnezzar, and all these other great kings. I'll not take time to do that, but I want you to turn with me back here into the book of Isaiah. Into the book of Isaiah, and let me straighten up one thing right now. In the 14th chapter, of the book of Isaiah. 
I want you to notice that we've got here a parable spoken against the king of Babylon. All right. Now, we have here the death, the death of Nebuchadnezzar, the very man that I'm talking about, and he dies right here in this chapter. He dies after he had reigned a number of years in Babylon, and after his death, we have it right here. Now, I want you to notice, if you will, please, begin re reading with me in verse 3. And it shall come to pass in the day that Jehovah shall give thee rest from thy sorrow, and from thy trouble, and from the hard service wherein thou hast made to serve, that thou shalt take up this parable against the king of Babylon. Mark that, Job. Now, we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased, that great city of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world? Jehovah hath broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers that smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke that ruleth the nations in anger, with a persecution that none restrained. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid low, no hewer is come up against us. Nebuchadnezzar was a great builder, ladies and gentlemen. Not only a great uh, magnificent administrator, but he was a great builder. And I'll read you in just a little while some of the histories that we have back here relative to the work of this man. Now, when he died, all the forest, figuratively speaking, personified as if they were alive and speaking, had rest because the hewers did not come up and cut those trees from the forest in relative to some kind of his building. Now, look at it. What did he say? Yea, the fir trees, and even Sheol from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. In other words, his spirit went down to the Sheol. This word Sheol is the very same word that we have in the New Testament translated Hades. This is the Hebrew word for the abode of the party spirit, like Hades is the Greek word for the same place. In other words, you've heard me say time and time again that when a person dies, his spirit goes into the Hades or the Sheol world. All right, here is where it is. Sheol from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. In other words, all the people that had preceded him in death were wakened and stirred up and were told that this great king, Nebuchadnezzar, was coming down just like them. Even all the chief ones of the earth, it has raised up from their throne all the kings of the nation. All they shall answer and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Now, ladies and gentlemen, in death there is no distinction. Do you understand that? All of us die the very same death. All of us will be taken to the very same place. I care not what your social status is. I care not what your economic status might be. When you die, you will go exactly where all the rest of them go. Now they said, Art thou become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to Sheol, and the noise of thy vows, the worm is spread under thee, the worm covereth thee. In other words, your body will be eaten by worms just like everyone else. Now, ladies and gentlemen, look at verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the morning? I'm reading the American Standard, but if I read right, the King James said Lucifer, doesn't it? And a lot of people say that this is where we have the authority for the devil being uh, thrown or hurled out of heaven. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he's not talking about the devil. He's not talking about Satan. If you'll understand and look down here, I want you to notice in verse 4 that this is a parable against the king of Babylon. We know who the king of Babylon was. Now, why can we not understand the Bible and interpret it like it ought to be interpreted? We're not talking about the devil in verse 13. We're talking about Nebuchadnezzar. How art thou fallen from heaven? I said in the book of Revelation that the word heaven many times has reference to the uh, political arena. In other words, you, Mohammed was. And these great uh, people over there that were praying in the sixth chapter for the mountains and the rocks and the stones to fall out. And when I said in the twelfth chapter that Michael and Satan had a war in heaven, and Satan was cast out of heaven. He wasn't talking about the little heaven where God was, but he was simply talking about the control of the political arena. You understand that? Now, this is what he's talking about here. O day star, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground? How art thou fallen from the heaven? Now, look at there. Isaiah uses almost the very same words that Daniel uses some three, four hundred years later. As a tree, how art thou cut down? The tree is cut down. See there? And thou saidest in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the uttermost parts of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to Sheol, to the uttermost parts of the pit. They that see thee shall gaze at thee and say, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, 
that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and overthrew the cities thereof, and let not loose his prisoners to their house. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is Nebuchadnezzar. This is the king that we're talking about here in the fourth chapter. Now turn with me, if you will, please, back to the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel. Now listen to what he said. These things will happen to you till, verse 25, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Now ladies and gentlemen, this is still truth. This is divine truth. The God of heaven is still ruling in the kingdoms of men. And he sets over these governments the man that he wants or the woman that he wants over them. I've said that time and time again, and I repeat it again, and if this passage is not applicable, if it's still not true, I want somebody to come forward and show me where it has been abrogated or done away. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the root of the tree, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. After seven years, in other words, God said, I'm going to destroy you just like I would cut out a tree, but I'm going to leave that stump in the ground, and when the time comes, it will sprout and bring forth new branches. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Nebuchadnezzar became a raving lunatic. He lost his mind. He became a madman. He became a maniac. As I've said, his hair grew long, his fingernail like claws, he got down on all fours and walked in the dew of the grass and ate grass like the beast of the field. And he stayed in this insane condition for seven years. At the end of which time he was restored, that stump of that tree began to sprout. And then, of course, his kingdom flourished again. Verse 27. Wherefore, O king, now this is the preaching of that. He told him what would happen before it happened. And he told him how this calamity could be diverted. But he didn't listen to him. Now what is this? This is number five in your notes. Turn to number five and see what it is. The advice of Daniel for him to repent of his sins and become a righteous man. And if not, what would be the results of his refusal? Now here we have it in verse 27. Wherefore, O king, let thy counsel like my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thy iniquity by showing mercy to the poor, if there be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Now, ladies and gentlemen, again, I, I can't stay off of preachers. I don't intend to stay off of them. Because it's a shame, it's a crying shame that our preachers do not have sufficient nerve to get up and tell people how to live and tell them they're in their sins. Here was a man of God, I'm talking about Daniel, that stood up in the very face of the greatest king of his time, Nebuchadnezzar, and said, you're a sinner. You're going to have to repent from your sins and turn to righteousness or else the God of heaven is going to bring you to your knees. Now, my friends, how many of my preaching brethren can do that? We've got brethren in the congregations that are economically well fixed. In other words, they're wealthy. They've got money. And our preachers become mush in their hands. They cannot control them. They do not have the nerve to get up and say you're a sinner. You're going to have to quit some of that stuff that you're doing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, again, let me recall your attention, or let me call your attention to the case of John the Baptist. Here is another case where John the Baptist stood up in the face of a king and said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now, ladies and gentlemen, wouldn't it be nice if we had people today, men in the pulpit, that would stand up and look the brethren square dive in the eyes and say, now, you're not going to do this. You're not living right. We're not going to condone it. You can do with us what you want to do with us, but this is the way the God of heaven tells me to preach, and this is the way it's going to be. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I resolved a long time ago that that's the way I'm going to preach. If the brethren like it, okay. If they don't like it, they can lump it. And that's exactly what I'm saying to you. You're going to have to repent of your sins, and you're going to humble yourselves, and you're going to turn from sin to righteousness. If you don't, you're going to bust hell fire wide open. And if you don't like this kind of preaching, reach over politely and turn off the knob. You're not obligated to listen to it. But if you listen to me any longer, this is the kind of preaching you're going to hear. Well, let's read on. Let's read on. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. Now, my friends, this happened. This happened. All of this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months. In other words, apparently a year from the time that Daniel told him what would happen, it happened. 
At the end of 12 months, he was walking in the royal palace of Babylon. Now, my friends, I wish that all of you would get you an encyclopedia and turn over under the word Babylon and read a description of that great city. It was one of the most magnificent things the world ever saw. It split the river Euphrates, or the river Euphrates split it right down the middle. It had these huge walls, 300 feet high, 30 feet into the ground, 87 and a half feet thick. Three chariots could drive around the top of it. They had those magnificent hanging gardens of Nebuchadnezzar rising up into the sky, 300 feet. Read about them in just a minute. Now here's where he was. He was walking in the midst of the royal palace of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this the great Babylon which I have built for the royal dwelling place by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to notice the use of those personal pronouns. Here is the thing that got him in, in trouble. Pride. Pride. Now, Solomon said in the book of Proverbs that pride goes before a fall. There you are. This man said, look. In other words, he was walking out there just like a lot of us do. Just like the rich farmer, you remember, over in the gospel, he says, look at these barns. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tear these down, these old barns, and I'll build me new ones. And I'll say to my soul, soul, take thy ease. But God said, you're a fool, because this night thy soul is required of thee. Now look what Nebuchadnezzar said. Look at him. He was walking out there, viewing, surveying all the things, the royal palaces, and all the things that he built. And he spake unto himself, he talked to himself, Is not this the great Babylon which I, look at that, I have built for the royal dwelling place by the might of my power, look at that, and for the glory of my majesty. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. Right then. That's how fast, ladies and gentlemen, calamity can fall upon us. This is how fast the fortunes can re be reversed in our life. Look at that. And thou shalt be driven from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. Thou shalt be made to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee. Seven years. Until thou know. Here's the third time, ladies and gentlemen, that this is repeated. Until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from man, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of the heaven, till his hair was grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. Now, ladies and gentlemen, isn't that a pitiful thing? Now, right here in our lifetime, we have seen some of these great dignitaries of the world fall. I have in mind the Shah of Iran. You remember? One of the great, powerful leaders of our time. You know anything about the peacock throne over there? You remember when Agnew was vice president under Richard Nixon? They had the 25th, 2500-year anniversary of the Persian Empire, and Agnew was the guest of state of the Shah. I have in my writings the menu that was served, the dinner served on that occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, words cannot fill. We do not have a sufficient vocabulary to talk about the money, the wealth, the power that that man had. Do you remember right here in our lifetime, I'm talking about less than 10, 15 years ago, he fell. The people of Iran disposed him. Remember that? He was kicked out of his country. This country would not receive him. He went down into Panama. He went to the Bahamas. Finally, they diagnosed him that he was eat up with cancer inside. And the man, this great man, could not find a place that, that would welcome him upon this earth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, don't think that it cannot happen. We've got the very same case right now with Marcus in the Philippines. Look at it. What happened to them? What happened to him? You know, I need not repeat this. Where is he now? He's in exile. He's in exile. His wife had 3,000 pairs of shoes, but what does he have now? He cannot even return to his own country. Now, ladies and gentlemen, don't think that the God of heaven cannot bring people down. What about this little man right down here in Panama? The very same thing. We read it all the time where men have to give up their power. The God of heaven said that this happened to him within an hour. Look at here. 
and his hair was grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. I can remember, ladies and gentlemen, a most horrible spectacle. Spectacle. When Earl Long was governor of Louisiana, I'm talking about the brother of the famous Huey Long, you know how he lost his mind while he was governor, and they had pictures there sitting on the side of the bed where he looked a most horrible spectacle. Now, ladies and gentlemen, don't think that it can't happen. It can happen to you. It can happen to me. It can happen to them. It can happen to any of us. Here this man was brought down, and he got down on all fours, and he walked. And he crawled just like a beast of the field in the ground, on the in, in the straw, in the grass, there on the ground. He got wet. His hair grew like eagle's feathers and the nails like bird's claws. Look at me. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven and my understanding returned unto me. I said, ladies and gentlemen, that he became a raving lunatic. He became a maniac. In other words, here it is. This is in his edict. This is in his uh, uh, proclamation. I lifted up my eyes unto heaven and my understanding returned. Now, ladies and gentlemen, how could his understanding return if it had not left him? In other words, he lost his mind. He became insane. And my understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom from generation to generation. Now, this is not unusual for him to do this. Every time he got in trouble, just like a lot of us, the first thing we want to do is to fall on our knees and call to God, and we'll remember him for a day or two, but just as soon as we get over our troubles, our misery, our calamity, the first thing you know, we turn our back on God again. Now, this is exactly what we have here. He says that the kingdom of God is forever, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. This is what he's saying. I'm not talking. Daniel's not talking. This is Nebuchadnezzar. And he doeth according to his will. Who? God. He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. In other words, he's got an army in heaven, ladies and gentlemen, that consists of a hundred million angels. One hundred million angels. Look at here. And among the inhabitants of the earth. Look at there. You really believe that? Well, he did. In other words, God rules among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand. Are saying to him, why doest thou this? My friends, we need to learn this. We need to learn this lesson. I made the statement at the outset when I started that there's not a chapter in the Bible. If it's analyzed correctly, if it's elucidated judiciously, from which we can draw any more lessons today than this fourth chapter of the book of Daniel. Listen to me. At the same time, my understanding returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent greatness was added unto me. Now watch me, ladies and gentlemen. Here is the effect that all of this insanity had on him. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all of his works are truth, and his ways justice, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. My friends, that scares me. That scares me. He says right here that those that walk in pride, he will abase. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's draw some lessons from this great book. I want to read to you some statements here from thoughts that I think I've read everything that I can find on the book of Daniel. As I said on the book of Revelation, I've got about every commentary that can be bought on it. I read it all. I think these are the finest words that's ever been penned on the book of Daniel. Listen to me. He says, the narrative in this chapter furnishes an illustration of the disposition among men to make arrangements for their own ease and comfort, especially in view of advancing years. Verse 4. Now, this is what Nebuchadnezzar did. In other words, after he had settled himself securely in his kingdom, he began to build a city, to build his royal palace, to build those walls. And this man says that this is what we do. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we spend a lifetime trying to get ready to retire in old age. Nebuchadnezzar had drawn around him all that is possible, perhaps, for men to accumulate with this view. He was at the head of the heathen world, the mighty monarch or the mightiest kingdom of the earth. He was at peace, having finished his wars and having been satiated with the glory of battle and conquest. He had enlarged and beautified his capital, beautified his capital so that it was one of the wonders of the world. 
He had built for himself a palace which surpassed in richness and eloquence and luxury all the inhabitations of man in that age. He had accumulated vast wealth and there was not a production of any kind which he could not command. Now was there anything that is supposed to be necessary to make man happy in this life which he had not in his possession? All this was the result of arrangement and purpose. He designed evidently to reach the point where he might feel that he was at ease and flourishing in his palace. I said, ladies and gentlemen, that when the decree came, when the insanity hit him, he was walking around and viewing everything he had. What was true in his case on a large scale is true of others in general, though on a much smaller scale. Most men would be glad to do the same thing, and most men seek to make such an arrangement according to their ability. They look to the time when they may retire from the toils and cares of life, with a competency for old age, and when they may enjoy life, perhaps many years, in the tranquility of honorable and happy retirement. We do it, ladies and gentlemen. It's happening today. The merchant does not expect always to be a merchant. The man in office not, is not, does not expect to be always burdened with the cares of state. The soldier does not expect always to be in the camp or the mariner on the sea. The warrior hopes to repose on his laurels. The sailor to find a quiet haven. The merchants to have enough to be permitted to sit down in the evening of life free from care. And the lawyer, the physician, the clergyman, the farmer, each one hopes after the toils and conflicts of life are over to be permitted to spend the remainder of his days in comfort if not in affluence. This seems to be based on some law of our nature. And it is not to be spoken of harshly or despised if it had no foundation in that which is great and noble in our being. Ladies and gentlemen, I like this. We all seem to be looking for a time of rest. I see in this a high and noble truth. It is that our nature looks forward to rest and that we are so made as to pant for repose, for calm repose when, we, when the work of life is over. As our maker formed us, the law was that we should seek this in the world to come, not here. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. It is a law of nature that all of us seek a repose and rest, but not here upon this earth. God did not intend it. Look at it. In that blessed abode, but he formed us that we should enjoy in that blessed abode where we may be free from all care and where there should be everlasting rest. But man naturally unwilling to look to that world has abused this law of his being and seeks to find the rest for which the soul pants in that interval, usually very short, and quite unfitted for tranquil enjoyment between the period when he toils and lies down in the grave. Now, my friends, we're looking for the wrong place and the wrong time to retire. The true law of our being would lead us to look forward to everlasting happiness. It ought to, but we abuse it and we pervert that law and seek to satisfy it by making provisions for a brief and temporary rest at the close of the present life. There is a person often going on, there is a process often going on in the case of these individuals to disturb or prevent that state of ease. Thus there was in the case of Nebuchadnezzar as intimated by the dream. Even then in his high state of grandeur, there was a tendency to the sad result which followed when he was driven from his throne and treated as a poor and neglected maniac. This was intimated by him to him by the dream, and to one who could see all the future, I'm talking about God, it would be apparent that things were tending to this result. The very excitement and agitation of his life, the intox intoxication of his pride, and the circumstances of ease and grandeur in which he was now placed, all tended by a natural course of things to produce what follows. Now, ladies and gentlemen, isn't that a sad thing? It is not always visible to men, but could we see things as God sees them? We would perceive that there are causes at work which will blast all those hopes of ease and disappoint all those expectations, expectations of tranquility. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what could they be? You think that you have everything going your way now? What could happen to you? Let me list a number of them. Write them down on your notes. Number one, you could have the loss of all that you possess that you hold it by an uncertain tenure, that riches often tend to themselves wings, often take to themselves wings. How many men, ladies and gentlemen, were rich today, poppers tomorrow? It's easy for us to lose everything that we have. Number two, we may lose this tranquility through the loss of a wife or a child, and all of our anticipated comfort shall be tasteless, for there shall be none with whom to share them. All right. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we know that to be so. And how many of us would give everything that we've accumulated upon this earth if we could reach out and pull back a wife or a child or a loved one or a mother or a father who has already passed on? Number three, this tranquility that we're uh, looking forward to in old age can be disrupted through the loss of reason. My friends, this is the thing that I want to talk about right now. As in the case of Nebuchadnezzar, for no human precaution can guard against that. There may be the loss of health, a loss against which no one can defend himself, which may render all of his preparation for comfort of no value. Death itself may come, for no one has any basis of counsel, calculation in regard to his own life. And no one, therefore, who builds for himself a palace can have any security that he will ever enjoy it. Men who build splendid houses for themselves may yet experience sad scenes in their dwellings. And if they could foresee all that will occur in them, it would so throw a gloom over all the future as to lead them to abandon the undertaking. Who would engage cheerfully in such an enterprise if he saw that he was constructing a house in which a daughter was to lie down and die, or from which his wife and children were soon to be born forth to the grave? In this chamber your child may be long sick, and that one you or your wife may lie down on a bed from which you will never rise. From those doors yourself, your wife, your child will be born forth to the grave. And if you saw all this now, how could you engage with so much zeal in constructing your magnificent habitation? Our plans of life should be forward or formed with a feeling that this is possible. Ladies and gentlemen, what am I saying? I can lose all that I have. I can lose my money. I can lose my family. I can lose my reason power. I can lose, lose my health. My friends, we need to understand it. I say not with a gloomy apprehension that these calamities will certainly come or with an anticipation or hope that they should. But ladies and gentlemen, but we should allow the possibility that these things may occur. They may occur in our lives. And they did occur in the life of this great Nebuchadnezzar. The dealings of God in our world are such as are eminently fitted to keep up the recognition of these truths. What occurred to Nebuchadnezzar and the humbling of his pride and the blighting of his anticipated pleasures is just an illustration of what is constantly occurring upon this earth. What house is there into which trouble, disappointments, and sorrow never come? I want to know it. I'm a preacher. And ladies and gentlemen, people bring me their problems in bushel baskets. I hear them every day. I know what I'm talking about. This little girl is pregnant. This son is on drugs. This wife is philandering and running around. That husband is a drunkard. I hear it every day. What scheme of pride is there to respect to which something does not occur to produce mortification? What house is there into which sickness, bereavement, and death never find its way? And what abode of man on earth can be made secure from the intrusion of these things? The counsel given by Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar in verse 27, my friends, to break off his sins by righteousness, that there may be a lengthening and out of the tranquility, is counsel and advice that may now be given to all sinners. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. Now listen, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. Daniel told, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that he ought to turn from his sins into a life of righteousness. Do we have any case of where people did that? My friends, I'm here to say that if you're a sinner, that the countdown is going on, and it's never too late for you to change. I want you to notice the illustration of the thought occurs in the preaching of Jonah to Nineveh. God told Nineveh, or told Nineveh through Jonah, that he was to go preach that in three days, is that what he said? Or 40 days, or a number of days, Nineveh would be destroyed. In other words, I'm going to give you a certain time to repent. If you don't do it, I'm counting down one, two, three, four, five, at the end of which, I'm going to destroy this city. Ladies and gentlemen, one time, back in the 38th chapter of the book of Isaiah, a prophet was sent to a king by the name of Hezekiah, and God told him to get his house in order because he was to die and not live. His time had come to depart this world. He prayed, he turned from his sins, he prayed to God. God gave him a respite, a reprieve. He extended his life 15 years. Now, don't tell me that had Nebuchadnezzar done what Daniel told him to do, that this would not have happened. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here, my time is about gone. 
But in this great fourth chapter of Daniel, we have an illustration in this account of the fourth chapter of Daniel of the evils of pride. The pride which we may have on account of beauty, our strength, our learning, our accomplishment, which we feel when we look over our lands that we have cultivated, or the houses that we have built, or the reputations which we have acquired, is no less offensive in the sight of the Holy God and was the pride of the magnificent monarch who looked down on the towers and the domes and the walls and the palaces of great, great, great city and said, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built? My friends, that's what we say. We look in the mirror and we say, We're beautiful. We say, I'm smart. I've got degrees. I've got a pocket full of degrees. This is pride, my friend. The same kind of pride that toppled Nebuchadnezzar. And in view of the calamity that came upon Nebuchadnezzar, and the treatment which he received in his malady, in his sickness, we may make the following remarks. We should be thankful for the continuance of our reason. When we look on such a case as this, or when we go into the lunatic asylums and see the wretchedness that the loss of reason causes, we should thank God daily that we are not deprived of this inestimable blessing. My friends, I visit the rest homes. I visit the old folks' homes, the convalescent homes. And inevitably, and without an exception, there's people there that know not who they are. They know not where they come from. In other words, they have lost all control of their reason whatsoever. A sad thing, a sad thing indeed. It can happen to me. It can happen to you. And this chapter right here is telling us that there is a possibility that this should happen. Ladies and gentlemen, there's very few of us who have not or may not have some friend or relative who will turn or is already insane. We know it. We know there's no sickness in the world like it. And there is no one who is not or may not be personally interested in the improvement which religion and science has made in the treatment of this class of unfortunate beings. There's no one as unfortunate as a person who loses the power of reasoning. I see also, ladies and gentlemen, the possibility of the loss of reason would be an element in our calcul calculation about the future. Now listen to me, friends. I've got about two or three minutes. If we lose our minds, ladies and gentlemen, our hope of making preparation for the future is over. You understand that? We may go to our deathbed. We may go to the last five, ten years of our life in one of these homes with no ability whatsoever to reason. I have people all the time to call me to the hospital and say, Brother Rudd, I'd like to talk, we'd like you to talk to my father or talk to my mother. And I go into the room and look and they're raining, raving maniacs. They have no concept of who I am or who they are. The children have not yet reached the conclusion that this is the state of affairs. They come out and say, Brother Rudd, did you tell them what their condition was? I shake my head and say, friends, I'm sorry. They've gone beyond the point of reasoning. They have no ability to reason. And this is a great responsibility. And ladies and gentlemen, this is what's being taught right here in this fourth chapter of the book of Daniel. I said before, I repeat again before I close, there's not a chapter in the Bible that I can draw more lessons that's applicable to us today than this great fourth chapter of the book of Daniel.